Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 137 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. This week I made a rather alarming discovery in a couple of apiaries and I wanted to share this grim story with you. Also coming up, I've traditionally always treated with oxalic acid between Christmas and the New Year, but this year I'm going to try something different. Listen into the horror story and my new approach to oxalic acid treatments and importantly, my reasons why. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. Hi, everybody, and a belated happy Thanksgiving to all of you, no matter where you are in the world. I know it's a traditional American celebration, but, well, if we can't pause and be thankful for making it this far through a terrible year, then when can we? Kicking off with the weather news... We've had our first frosts of the autumn, but it's still been another drizzly and damp week. It's actually lovely and sunny out there at the moment, and the forecast, while not gloriously sunny for the week ahead, it does look like it's going to stay dry for a while, so we can be thankful for that. It's been another busy week for me. A couple of frustrating delays with deliveries have put my plans back for the new product launch, but I promise I'm not going to turn this week's podcast into a moaning session. There was one slightly alarming apiary visit this week that I wanted to share with you all. I've suffered a couple of colony losses. Now, I don't know if they qualify for winter losses or not, as we're not strictly into winter officially yet, but a loss is a loss, and it's both distressing and perplexing. So here's what I found. I was at the Hillside Allotments Apiary filming a video about putting on mouse guards. Nothing too difficult here. You simply hold the mouse guard in front of the entrance and pin it in place. The only thing I would say as a word of caution is do check the mouse guard doesn't completely cover the entrance and block the bees returning or leaving the hive. The metal strips that I have are galvanised and have a double row of holes punched into them. This leaves a strip of metal unpunched and wide enough that if you inadvertently put it on upside down, it could block the entrance completely. So if you are putting on mouse guards or have already done it, it may be worth just having a quick check to make sure all is okay. Anyway, back to the troubling scenario I found at the apiary while we were filming. It was a fairly cold day, and so not many bees were flying. An ideal opportunity to fit mouse guards, as it happened, but it doesn't let you see bees flying from each hive, so you can't really tell if everything is okay. And the bees are popping out for water or for cleansing flights. At the Hillside Allotments Apiary, we have a mix of hive types. Commercials, Nationals, Langstroths, Polycommercials, Those are the ones from Maysmore Apiaries, and we also have a few nukes, the BS Honey ones. As I think I've mentioned before, one of the advantages of the poly hives is they mostly have a clear plastic coverboard or crown board. These allow you to discreetly lift the roof and have a peep inside without alarming the bees, so generally there's no need for a smoker or bee suit. I took this opportunity to have a look at the Maysmore Poly Hive, as I didn't have my smoker with me, and popping the wooden crown boards inevitably causes the bees to alarm, and if they're feeling grumpy enough, they'll pop up and say hello in their usual way. Lifting the lid of the hive caused my heart to sink. I'd previously been over to a couple of other apiaries with the Honeypore Hives, and these have the same setup with the extended roof and clear cover board. As soon as I look into those, I could see large colonies of bees moving around all the frames, not yet clustered, and looking really healthy and fantastic. But this was totally different. Nothing was moving. It was cold, and they could have been clustered lower down on the frames, but I would normally anticipate seeing one or two bees moving up to the top bar as the daylight hits the cover board. But there was nothing. I hefted the back of the hive, My instincts were telling me that these bees should be fine, but my head was screaming at me that they were dead. 
The hive was incredibly light, even for a poly hive. At this time of year, I would normally be expecting a decent amount of weight at the back of the hive as I lift it. Bees and lots of stored food. But this was not what I was getting. There was something horribly wrong. I lowered the hive and checked the entrance for any signs of movement. Nothing. With a sense of doom, I pulled back the clear cover board, still hoping that bees would pop up and prove me wrong, but still nothing. I used my hive tool and broke the propolis glue that had locked the frame solid. Using the J tool, I eased the first frame out. It was completely empty, still no signs of life. They must be dead, or they would have been out and at me by now. I popped the next few frames, desperate to get into the middle of the frames to see what had happened. Removing the two central frames, it was blatantly obvious what had happened. There was a small cluster of dead bees sandwiched between two frames, and hundreds if not thousands of dead bees in cells all around them, heads buried deep to the bottom of the cell. They had starved. Each frame was the same, hundreds of bees, buried in the cells, desperate to get at food that had run out. I still can't quite believe what I saw. Let me just rewind back to the summer with this colony and explain their history. It doesn't explain why this has happened, but it's nice to share their story and maybe someone out there might have an idea as to why this has happened. The colony was originally taken to the oilseed rape in April for the pollination, and it was there that I discovered that they had really severe chalk brood. I mean, really, really severe chalk brood. It was pretty much every frame, and I had decided we would remove the queen if the chalk brood didn't subside. It sometimes happens. Bad chalk brood just seems to clear up all by itself as the bees get into the late spring warmth and on into summer. They were quite productive on the oilseed rape, despite the chalk brood. We had two very full supers of honey off them, and the chalk brood did indeed start to subside. It was always present though, and I again decided we would requeen once we moved them back to their summer apiary site. The bees were returned to the hillside allotments apiary for the summer flow, and miraculously the chalk brood completely disappeared. It was really strange because I had gone to the apiary with the intention of removing the queen, and, as if by magic, not a sign of chalk brood anywhere in the hive. So she got a reprieve and the colony went on to produce another two full supers of honey. By the time we got to removing the honey, the colony had become a very full commercial brood box and was bursting with bees. They hadn't swarmed and had given four full supers of honey. That didn't seem too bad after all. Varroa treatments were added, and in mid-September, feeders were also added, and each colony in this apiary given about a third of a 14 kilo jerry can of heavy sugar syrup. The reason for this is an attempt at adding some sugar syrup to the incoming ivy nectar in a somewhat naive attempt at preventing the ivy honey from granulating horribly in the brood combs, and thus the bees not being able to use it. Once that's been taken, I give them a week or so and then get the rest of the sugar syrup. So a 14 kilo jerry can on top of the ivy nectar going in. And at this apiary, we're surrounded by ivy and the bees and wasps gorge themselves on it. Feeding done, the feeders were removed maybe mid-October and the hives hefted to feel the weight. And they all seemed okay, including this Maysmore poly hive. You get a feel for how heavy a hive should be. I've never weighed my hives with scales, but maybe I should from now on. Anyway, they weren't any different from other colonies in the apiary. A decent weight and enough apparently to see them through to at least Christmas when I normally carry out the oxalic acid treatments and add some fondant. So that brings us up to date and the tragic sight of a completely empty brood box and a lot of dead bees. So what's happened here? Well, honestly, I'm not too sure. In a bit of a panic, I dashed back to the unit, grabbed boxes of fondant and went straight back. Yet other colonies at this site were full of bees, heavy when hefted and seemed completely fine. I still added fondant to all of them. 
I have to say there were a couple of lighter boxes, but nothing as extreme as the polyhive. And the other polyhives in the apiary were also full of bees and reasonably heavy with stores. Could it be that the ivy failed to produce as much nectar as previous years? But maybe it's the strain of bees. I have known colonies to gorge themselves on stores and just produce masses of bees, but it just seems a little bizarre really. It doesn't appear to have been robbing. They were a fairly strong colony and I never saw wasps giving them a hard time or other bees robbing them for that matter. Having checked all the other colonies both here at the allotments apiary and elsewhere, I found one other colony that had gone exactly the same way, completely empty of food stores, where other colonies seem nicely heavy and ready for the winter. To alleviate some of my worries, I've added fondant to way more colonies than I would normally do at this time of the year. A kind of security blanket for me, and hopefully a little insurance policy for the bees. It is possible to get the feeding completely wrong at times and cause a mini crisis, but I genuinely don't think I did anything differently with these colonies than with the rest. That's beekeeping for you, I guess. Moving on to the oxalic acid treatments, I've been monitoring some of our colonies, not least because of the increased worry of starvation, but I wanted to bring forward my varroa treatments using oxalic acid sublimation. Winter treatment for varroa using oxalic acid is probably a discussion for a complete podcast, maybe next week, but I wanted to let you know what I'm doing and why, just in case anyone out there was also thinking of doing the same, or no doubt already doing something completely different. My normal treatment of oxalic acid over winter is completed between Christmas and the New Year. A single treatment of sublimated oxalic acid crystals, and it's always seemed to do the trick nicely. Recently, though, I've been thinking about the annual life cycle of the colony and the potential for the broodless period in the colony to shift. To put this into perspective, I tend not to inspect the bees much through late September and into October, so knowing what's happening exactly in the brood area is more guesswork and historical than actual knowledge. I've always tended to think of the broodless period as being in the depths of winter, near the longest day, but this year, a couple of things have made me reassess this opinion. Firstly, I started getting a lot of messages around early to mid-October saying beekeepers had queenless colonies. There's always one or two beekeepers that get unlucky and find themselves through no fault of their own with a queenless colony and desperate for a replacement queen. But more often than not, it turns out to be a supersedure queen. A replacement queen produced by the colony to take over from the old, possibly failing queen. Occasionally, it's a natural lull in egg laying as the colony shifts its focus from brood to food for the winter, and I suspect this is the whole point. This was the first time I'd actually thought, why not treat with oxalic acid sublimation then, rather than wait until the colony had settled down for the early start of winter, and had maybe started to produce a little brood again. The point here being that Varroa need open brood to hide in before the cell is sealed and they reproduce. The second time I got thinking about it was during a bee farmer's presentation where I saw a graph of the annual cycle of a colony showing brood and adult bees. It's a much more detailed graph than I'd seen previously and it's available for all on the excellent website run by Randy Oliver and it's called Scientific Beekeeping. I'll link it in the podcast notes. Anyway, the autumn drop-off shown in brood numbers is quite stark and seemed to confirm my earlier thoughts. Perhaps the best time to treat isn't between Christmas and the New Year after all. It's right now, in fact. Well, it's about a month ago, actually. But as always, I have a giant spanner to throw into the works. And this goes back to the dead colony. I was chatting to some fellow bee farmers last night and several commented that a lot of colonies had been producing a lot more brood later into the autumn this year. And, thinking back to my colony losses, it could be that these colonies produced so much brood that they've very quickly eaten their way through all of the food and thus starved. I'm going to have to keep a watchful eye on all the colonies this winter 
and keep the fondant topped up. I'm feeling a little nervous, despite all the other colonies appearing fine. The upshot is that I'm going to treat with oxalic acid sublimation earlier, probably next week, and maybe treat more than once to ensure catching the varroa as they emerge from any brood that might be present. But I'll save that discussion for next week. Do check out my Patreon page for updates of my monthly Zoom meetings, but until next time, I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was beekeeping short and sweet. (laughs) 